slides. So you get the summary now. <laughs> uh, so last spring, 2023, I graduated from Middlebury College up in Vermont um, with a degree in physics. And um, since then, starting in the fall, I started at the University of Virginia pursuing my PhD in astronomy. Um, and here I will be working with La Universidad Católica, um, working on another astronomy project. So I'm here to talk about that a bit today. Getting right into it, I study galaxy mergers. Um, so on a big broad scale, you have the universe expanding post Big Bang, but at the same time on a smaller scale, you have inter visual galaxies interacting with one another, trying to find their new gravitational center as they collide. And as they do that, you get these pretty gnarly shapes. <laughs> um, so some of the key features that we see in mergers are these tidal tail-like features, I realize they're a bit faint here. But they stretch out, and you look like these tails. On another end, you might see almost like shells kind of whipping out. Um, and so you basically, as these galaxies collide and their gravities interact, you get these really unique features and shapes, and they form some of the most extreme environments that we see in space. Um, and we care about these phases of astronomy because, um, well, we talk about hierarchical models of galaxy growth, which is a fancy way of saying galaxies grow by merging with one another. And during, during that merger process, you have this sudden influx of gas and dust as you collide, and that fuels rapid star formation that also works as, serves as fuel for black holes that are going to consume that gas. And that's actually the particular interest of mine in that I study uh, black holes in these merger galaxies. So the idea is that at the center of all galaxies, as far as we know, there is a supermassive black hole. And so when you have two galaxies that collide, well, something has to happen because now you have two supermassive black holes. So do those merge? How do they do that? On what time scales does that occur? These are some of the ongoing questions in astronomy that we're hoping to answer. And when you talk to most astronomers, you'll hear them use the word active galactic nuclei, or AGN, when they talk about black holes. And that's because these are, well, these aren't just the black hole. These are black holes that are actively consuming the gas that is surrounding it. So you have these spinning disks of gas that are being sucked into the black hole. You also have from all that pressure, some gas that's spewing out and outflows. And so when we talk about AGN, we're talking about not just the black hole, but also the entire system around it. And we care about these AGN because they signify a phase of growth for the black hole. So at the same time that these galaxies are colliding and growing, you also see the black holes that are growing as well. And so when we model these galaxy mergers, the theory is that we should be seeing hundreds of these dual AGN systems, where you have two black holes, lots of dust and gas, lots of growing, lots of AGN. And yet, for some reason, when we actually go to observe galaxies where we're expecting to see it, we've only seen, well, there's been a few dual AGN on really large separations, but at separations less than 3,000 light years, we're only seeing three, which is a shockingly small number. And 3,000 light years, that's a pretty big distance. <laughs> um, for some context, the distance from Earth to the Sun is about eight light minutes. So that should help contextualize how big of a distance this is. And so the question is, well, why aren't we seeing it? Are, we, are our models wrong? What's going on? And quite simply, dust and gas makes mergers hard to study. Um, us astronomers, we study light from the sky. And when there's walls of dust that's blocking the light, you can't see what's at the center. You can't see this AGN system that we're hoping to uncover. And so the solution here that I'm hoping to work on with my project is this exciting technology that we have here in Chile. So just north of us in the Atacama Desert, we have my personal favorite telescope, um, ALMA. Um, and I'll go through each word in this lovely acronym here. Atacama, of course, located in the Atacama Desert. The large, well, each antenna is 20 meters in diameter in this telescope. Um, millimeter, submillimeter, well, that's the wavelength regime that we study in. And that, I will explain that a bit more in a second. But, um, you know, we don't just study light that we can see. We study light at different frequencies. And different frequencies give us different types of information. And so this telescope focuses on the millimeter range. And then this last part is also the exciting feature about the ALMA telescope is that it consists of 66 high precision antennas. And to help you guys visualize that, I have this lovely photo. Um, so these, this is one of the array configurations, but uh, when we talk about 66 antennas, well, this is basically a bunch of tiny telescopes that are all spread out in different configurations. When I say tiny, they're each 20 meters. Um, but they operate as one giant telescope. And the key with this is that 
what this allows us to do is to uh, observe the same target at many, many different angles as if you have one giant telescope of this size, but it uses considerably less resources and money. Um, and so this serves as one of the most cost efficient, but also one of the biggest projects in astronomy right now. And so this allows us to obtain pretty high sensitivity and high resolution um, observations. But going back to that millimeter point, I have a lovely figure, probably you've seen it in grade school or something. Um, <laughs> but when we talk about millimeter, it sounds like a pretty small amount, but it's actually pretty on the, on the longer wavelength side of things. And, uh, hold on, I say that there, there we go. Um, and so we refer to millimeter as probably far infrared to radio regime, um, where you have much higher frequency observations when you go to x-rays or gamma rays. Um, and we care about this because uh, well, it's the same concept as why our phones work when we're inside. Longer wavelength uh, waves can pass through um, much more particles than shorter wavelengths can. Uh, you can think of it as uh, a much higher frequency wave is going to bump into a lot more particles before it can get to us, whereas a longer radio wavelength can reach us. And so using this concept, we can basically say, well, we can use millimeter or longer wavelength radio observations to study things that could be hidden behind walls of dust and gas. That is whatever is at the center of those merging galaxies. And using that same logic, you can say, OK, well, then these waves can also pass through the atmosphere quite comfortably. When you observe in the more visible light regime, you have to think about all these atmospheric effects, um, the weather situation. But when you talk about radio, it's a lot more flexible. You can, you can observe during the day, which is exciting. <laughs> um, and uh, so you don't have to worry about these added components. And so basically now we have the technology. So what are we going to do with it? So I have some photos of six of our 12 galaxies. I admit they're blurry, but that's because these are the pre-ALMA <laughs> images that were out there. Uh, so these images were taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. And they're a bit blurry, but you can still see some of these merger features. Um, so when we talk about, so I call these galaxies post-merger features. And why I say that is because when we talk about mergers that are still happening early on, you can see, you can still kind of make out the two different galaxies. You can see the two nuclei. In this case, I would say you can disagree with me, but I say I only see one nucleus. Uh, but at the same time, you are still seeing some of those merger features, those signs of disruption. Uh, so the, because of that, we can say, okay, we're seeing a merger history of single nucleus. I'm going to characterize these as, as post-mergers. Based on that hierarchical model I talked about, Oops, that's too early. Uh, because of that hierarchical model I talked about, since we're expecting dual AGN, this phenomenon, to exist in mergers, we've basically determined that these post-merger galaxies are the most likely hosts um, of these, this dual AGN phenomenon that we're looking for. And what's exciting about ALMA is because we have all those antennas, because we have all those different angles to observe these galaxies, we can identify dual AGN down to separations of about 150 light years, which is a lot better than that 3,000 light year mark that we have where we have only three below that. So this survey that I'm presenting, it basically has, oh, that's sorry, uh, the potential to uncover dual AGN are very close separations that we have never seen before. And because of those longer wavelengths, we don't have to worry as much about the dust and gas that causes issues when we're observing these at different wavelengths. So when you go into the bigger science questions, well, the first one is, well, how many dual AGN do we actually see? We're expecting a lot, but what if we find none? If that case, that would mean that maybe our current models aren't that accurate. On the other hand, if we find a lot, this could help improve those models um, and give us a better sense of what fraction of these merger galaxies would have dual AGN. And if we're seeing it a lot, it'll also give us insight into how critical this phase is for the growth of black holes. If it's happening very frequently, it must mean that this is a pretty key phase, um, that, or pretty key avenue that black holes take in order to grow. But the second question that I'm hoping to really look into is, well, are the properties of these galaxies that host dual AGN, are they different from those that don't? So how does this a black hole merger process affect uh, the gas kinematics? Does the gas move differently in those galaxies? Do the dust, does the dust accumulate differently? And does the interaction between the black hole and its environment affect the way stars form? Does it affect the shape of the galaxy? And so these are some of the, the bigger questions about black hole evolution, but also the galaxy evolution, and how those two are connected that I'm, I'm hoping to uncover through this work. And yeah, that's sort of the summary of my project. Thank <laughs> you.